Let's know. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, everybody. How is everybody? Y'all doing okay? Some of the crew I saw before noticed they're trying to avoid eye contact. Yeah. They're like, uh oh, she picks on people. But from the crew that I worked with earlier today, what's the thing you do if you don't want to play with me? What do you do? Time out and I'll quit because I don't actually have dementia and your desire not to interact with me. Uh, what I'm going to have you do is we're going to talk about positive communication in this session. And what I'm going to have you do is partner up. And I had you all do that in the last session, but I need you to do it again because dementia does not occur in isolation. A person may have dementia, but those around them will need to figure out how to help that individual living with dementia. Okay? So go ahead and find a partner. Everybody needs a partner. And I'm going to ask somebody to be brave enough to step up and be my partner. Oh, you will? Okay. Cool. Whichever one of you wants to partner. That's cool. Hey, I'm Tipa, and you're? Francisco. Oh, Francisco, you're the guy she's talking about. Cool. All right. Has everybody got a partner? Okay, here's what I want you to do. I want you and the person that you're going to partner with to decide which of you has dementia. You do. Okay. And I hope you enjoyed the moment because in real life you don't get to pick if you get dementia or not. It just happens. Um, and when I say that, I'm not saying it lightly. In family situations, sometimes the person with dementia, we wish it was the other older person that we've run across, the other elder, because they're so easygoing. And the one that has dementia is so challenging. But it doesn't happen that way. I mean, there's no rule about if you're hard-nosed, you will get dementia, and if you're easygoing, you won't. I mean, it doesn't work like that. Everybody's at risk. Okay, and We'll talk about risk factors. It's a whole other talk. What I want you to do, though, person with dementia, I want you just to sit there because you think everything's okay. You haven't really realized that you have a life-changing, life-altering disease. You don't realize that it's going to change everything about you eventually. You actually, if you think you know something, what you probably have noticed is you might be having some trouble with memory. And one of the biggest fallacies, one of the biggest mistakes we make is thinking Alzheimer's equals dementia equals memory problems. You need to get rid of that right now. Dementia equals brain failure. And as long as you're just thinking memory problems, you're denying the devastation that someone is trying to live with as they go through this disease process. And we're, I'm going to show you some pictures to help you get your head around this. And we're going, to, we're going to work with this because what's really critical to keep in mind is they're doing the best they can do with what they have left throughout the disease. Our challenge is to be the best we can be to match up. But here's how it happens if you're not thinking about it. He has dementia, and I know it. Okay, so caregivers, raise your hand. You're the one without dementia. Okay, just so you know. I mean, in this moment, we're going we're gonna to separate the two, though sometimes I'm not so sure about some of y'all. Okay, here's what I want you to do. I want you to take this hand, put it up, and I don't want you to put it down. I want you to put it in front of you. The, the, one, and, and the caregiver, look at your hand, and I want you to gaze at it lovingly. And I want you to think to yourself, this is what you think as a caregiver. This is a loving, caring hand. I'm going to give loving care. I am here to help. I'm going to help the poor, demented person. I'm going to make a difference in their life. I know they need help. Okay, caregivers, have you got the feel of how you feel about your... I mean, you love what you do. You want to help. So take this loving, caring hand, caregiver, and shove it right in the face of the person with dementia. Go ahead and shove it right in their face. Now, how many people who just had a hand shoved in your face, your very first thought is, oh, gee, thank you. <laughs> how many people, your first gut reaction to that is, what do you think you're doing shoving your hand in my face? <laughs> and what I'm going to tell you is when you become a caregiver, all too often you see what's wrong, and so you try to help people by pointing out what they're doing wrong, where they're making mistakes, where they're, uh-uh. No, remember, I already told you. Hey, Greg, you already had lunch. Uh-uh. No, remember? Uh-uh. Uh-uh. No, no. Remember? Remember? Don't you remember? Say remember. remember. Don't you remember? remember? Remember I told you. Remember. remember you agreed. Remember you already. No, you didn't. Remember? No, no. We just you remember? Remember? No, remember I gave you your medication. No, remember? No, your daughter's coming to remember. Don't you remember? Say remember three more times. Go ahead and get it out of your system. 
Okay, now I want you to take the word remember, say remember one more time, remember. Now spit it out. Spit it out and now get rid of it. It has no place in your conversation. Oh, look, the man with my favorite thing. Thanks. So I can use both hands to torture you. Here. Yeah, thanks. Perfect. Thanks. Wonderful. <laughs> we don't want him to have that kind of power. That would be a problem. Okay. So here's what happens almost universally. Turn this way just a little bit, Francesca, if you would. Francisco. Francisco. Francisco sorry, Francesca. I'm oh, not good. I know. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Oh, wait a minute. Okay, caregiver, shove at your person. Go ahead and shove at them. The typical reaction from a person with dementia is they will take their hand and put it against yours. So go ahead, put your hands together. Now, caregivers, I want you to notice something. As soon as you felt the hand touched yours, you pushed a little harder. <laughs> Go ahead, try it again. Make sure you feel that. So you put your hand up. When they push, you push back immediately. Did you feel the automatic? It was automatic. The reason you do that, in your mind, you're trying to maintain the status quo. You want them, you know, you know they need help. So here's what happens. Okay, I'm going to give you a real life example, for instance. I, I say to the person, oh, you didn't change your clothes. Because, you know, they went in to change their clothes and they came back and they hadn't changed their clothes. They still have breakfast all down their front. And so I say, oh, you didn't change your clothes. And they say, yeah, I did. I just put these on. And you will say, no, these are the same ones you had on earlier. Remember? <laughs> okay. And then they will say, no, I just put them on. And you'll go, no, look, let me, okay, so what I want you to do is really lean into this. Okay, keep going. Come on, give it more. You have more to give it. I know you're good caregivers. Give it everything you've got. Let me ask you something. Where are you going? I'm going to ask you again, where are you going? Nowhere. Who needs to figure that out? The caregiver, because the person with dementia is simply reacting to what you started. So here's the first thing. When you're a caregiver, get ready. You're going to make mistakes. Get over it. If you want to be perfect, go find another job. Because you're trying to think for another person who's lived another life, you're never going to get it perfect. You've got to give that one up. You've got to be willing to have uh-ohs. Uh-ohs are mistakes that you recognize. The important thing is you recognize the mistake. The sooner you recognize it, the better. So here's what's going to happen. I try to offer you help, but you don't like it and you push back. As soon as your hand makes contact, ease off. Don't push back at all. Go ahead and try that. See what happens as soon as you don't push back. What happens if you don't push back? They quit pushing. Why push when there's nothing to push against? So if he says, I say, let's go back to the situation where I say, oh, I thought you were going to change your clothes. And he says, well, I did change my clothes. Instead of saying, no, you didn't, or those are the same clothes, I'll say, you changed your clothes. Okay. All I did was repeat the words he gave me. I didn't, I didn't argue with him at all. And as soon as I, I don't argue, guess what? It's over. Because what you have to do is quit shoving back. You got to quit. It's not going to get you where you want to go. All it does is build resistance. When you resist resistance, all you get is more resistance. We could say the same thing about a family member, though. Family member comes in and says, why is my father wet? You people. Now, the gut reaction is, well, we tried to help your dad change. And he was really not wanting to do that right then. Now, I'm going to tell you the typical phrase that's going to get used in many, many situations. Are you ready? As much money as I am spending. Because guess what? I am frustrated that this is happening. And I thought that this was a good place. Now, notice how that triggered that sort of gut thing back. You want to say, well, this is a good place. <laughs> OK? But all that is is pushing back and forth. Whether it's the person with dementia or their family member, we need to give that ease off. 
you were, you're really frustrated that your dad is wet. You're disappointed. I'm, I hear you. Yeah, it's really difficult. We were really working on it, but we're really running into some barriers. Now, notice how that's a little different. That's not me shoving and you pushing back. We've stopped. So look at your person, because here's what you got to do when you have an uh-oh. Say uh-oh to your person. Uh-oh. Now, here's what I want you to say. I'm sorry. Look at him. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. No. Uh-uh. Here's what I saw. I'm sorry. Don't go there. I want you to look at your person, and I want you to move this hand out from between you. This is what it is you want to get done. Get it out of the way. It doesn't really have any place in the relationship right now. You need to see the person behind the dementia and quit getting lost in the dementia. If they're a person first and they have dementia second, you're letting the dementia block you from what's really going on here. So move it out of the way. Get it out of the middle. Look at your person and say, I'm sorry. Now I'm going to give you five I'm sorry's because you need lots. You need lots of different I'm sorry's because you're going to have lots of different screw-ups. Okay, you ready for your first I'm sorry? Okay, here's your first I'm sorry. Are you ready? Are you sure? Okay, here's what you're going to say. I'm sorry I made you, and add the emotion. I'm sorry I made you angry. I'm sorry I made you frustrated. I'm sorry I made you feel a certain way. So try that one. Say that with your partner. I'm sorry I made you angry with me. I'm sorry I made you angry. I know. I mean, it was, it was, it was my fault. I apologize. Now, when you say the emotion out loud, this is an important thing for people with dementia. Because many people with dementia are becoming less aware of exactly what it is they're feeling inside. All they know is this is not right. And they're going to tend to direct that outward. And so what happens is they look angry. They are angry, but they don't actually realize they're looking angry. They just, they want you, you go on. You don't come in here like you're the one who does the thing with that ridiculous idiot. I'm sorry I made you angry. Well, you did, and you just need to ask is all. Use my words. I will ask. You want me to ask. You want me to ask. Yes, I do. People who come into people's things need to, to, to say it. You're absolutely right, Tifa. I should have said it. You're not done apologizing yet. How can you tell? <laughs> How can you tell? Because I'm still angry. Yeah. You need to keep apologizing until I'm done. Because if you don't, turn your back and walk out. Don't you walk away from me. I'm talking to you. Why? Because it felt like we weren't done yet. So you've got to be willing to not be scared. You've got to be willing to come where I'm at. So the first kind of I'm sorry to think about is, I'm sorry I made you feel a certain way. And you'd be willing to say it out loud because sometimes they need to hear it out loud. When I hear it out loud, that helps me. Turn to your partner. I'm going to tell you the biggest mistake you make related to this. Are you ready? Caregivers, are you ready? Do what I do. Are you ready? Calm down. <laughs> No, you have to, uh-uh, come on, you got to do the hand thing. Calm down, I need you to calm down. <laughs> what does that make you want to do? When I do this, what do you want to do? I just kind of want to go back. Not <laughs> yeah, you're a flight <laughs> person, <laughs> yeah. Most people want to go, don't tell me to calm down. I'm mad, damn it, and don't you, don't you, don't you, don't you. So what happens is when you say calm down, what you're saying to me is I don't have a right to feel the way I feel. Who made you the boss of me? <laughs> you think you know everything. Now, I'm going to give you the second I'm sorry. Try this one. This one sometimes is a helpful one. I'm sorry I was trying to help. Say that one. I'm sorry I was trying to help. 
Now, I'm going to tell you, if you pushed a little too hard before you said it, here's going to be what their response is. Well, you are not very helpful. <laughs> That's when you're going to want to say, yes, ma'am, I know. I apologize. You're right. I was not very helpful. I'm sorry I made you angry. That's not what I meant to do. I was trying to help. Using their words and then going back to what it is that's driving this behavior. Because my behavior is being driven by who? Me. You. You think it's all about me, but it's not. You're actually driving me frequently because you're trying to help. But I didn't even know I needed help. You know, I run places like this. I'm a nurse. Oh, that's your hell on earth right there. That's, oh, Lord, you're in trouble. Oh, boy. Yeah, she's a nurse. Doctors, nurses, lawyers, Indian chiefs. I mean, people who are in charge of things are going to give you the hardest run for your money. People who are the bosses of things, because this disease is robbing them of that, and they don't like it. They don't like it at all. And any time you show them evidence that you think you're the boss of them, and it can be something simple like, Tipa, come on, I need you to come get something. To Don't tell me what to do. Yes, ma'am, I'm sorry. Absolutely. I apologize. I was trying to help. Well, I know what I need. Yes, ma'am, I know you do. Would you rather have Coke or would you rather have a soda, another kind of soda? Okay, because I don't know what I need. That's the problem, but I'm not, trust me, I'm not going to tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> Notice how I can mock. Ooh. Third, I'm sorry. You ready for the third one? I'm sorry I treated you like a child. Now, they'll give you the hint that that's the right one to do. I am not a child. I know I, you, who told you to come in here. I know when I need to pee. I do not need to be taken like some of these idiots. Whoa. Okay. Now, I'm being ugly to other people because I feel like I am better than they are, and you're triggering a lot of emotion in me because I am having trouble making it to the bathroom on time. I am having trouble recognizing my internal cues. I'm waiting too long, and I'm having accents. Well, I'm embarrassed about that. And I don't need some snivelly-nosed little snot pointing it out. I have a PhD. What am I saying? I'm smart. Guess what this disease is making me feel? Really stupid. And I don't like being stupid. And I don't like people pointing out that I'm not like I was because that makes me feel stupid. How many people in this room value how bright you are? Yeah. This disease will take that from you and leave you wondering, well, no, I, I know. I know the... Uh, the thing that you say, the things that you say, you know, the um, one after the others. The, the, um, you put one after the other and there's a dot at the end. Yes, the words. What did you think I was talking about? Smart ass. <laughs> now, why am I being angry? She, she gave me what I was looking for. How quick did she come up with it? Really fast. Guess what I'd been doing for three minutes? Struggling. Struggling it. And I have a PhD. Do you not get this? And so what I do is some people get sad, and you'll see them. I don't know what's wrong. I don't know what's wrong. I just don't know what. What is the matter with me? You feel bad about them. But the other ones will go, gotcha. Nail you to the wall. They hire the stupidest damn people to work here. Do you speak English? <laughs> and you're just thinking, you're the one that can't find words. <laughs> Remember, you're the caregiver. Okay. When you pull too many double, doubles, be careful. Okay. Now, I'm going to give you another I'm sorry. I was three so far. One was about how you make them feel, motions-wise. The second one is acknowledging you were trying to help and you made a mistake. The third is that you made them feel stupid or like a child. If somebody says, do you think I'm an idiot? 
You need to be real willing to say, I'm sorry, Tifa, I certainly didn't make you, made you, make you feel stupid. You are one of the smartest women I know. You better acknowledge what it is they're trying to tell you, because if not, they will escalate in order to get you to get it. Now they're yelling and throwing things because you're not listening. And if you just say, calm down, <laughs> you're not listening. <laughs> I am not about to calm down until we come to resolution here. The fourth, I'm sorry, okay? So the first was, I'm sorry I'm trying to help, or that was the second one. Sorry I made you feel angry, sad, whatever. Third one is stupid or childlike or childish, those kind of things. The next one, this is actually one of my very favorites. I'm sorry, this is hard. And that is one of my absolute favorites because when I'm struggling, and, and you know the thing, the thing is that you know, don't, don't tell me about the, I know this. You do know, say, say my words, you do know this, Tifa. I'm sorry, this is really hard. Try it with your partner. I want the person with dementia to be distressed because this is when somebody's distressed. They are trying to, trying to, um, and I want you to struggle. Watch me a second before you do it so that everybody's tuned in. People with dementia, you're going to say, Think of something you want to tell somebody. And then I want you to get stuck before you get to the noun. I want to tell you about my, my, um, you know, my, my, um, my, uh, the, um, you know exactly what you want to say, but the word will not come to you. So I want you to really get stuck in that moment, and I want the person who's trying to help you to look at you straight in the eyes and say, your name, Beth, I'm sorry, this is really hard. You're trying so hard. Pause. And let's see what happens next. Go ahead, try it. You're you want to do it to me? Oh, I'm sure. Go ahead, you can do it to me. <laughs> okay. So are you supposed to be trying to say something? Yeah. So I'm being yeah. Stuff, right? No, listen. Listen. Do you I you know the um the one the one who um she the one that that, that comes in the um I'm sorry to you. I know this is really hard. I'm really trying. Yeah, and I, I can't, I can't, I can't, now, now say you can't, you can't, I can't think of the thing, the thing, the thing to, to, to say it, to say what you want to say, yeah, I know it's hard, I hate this, <laughs> I know you hate it, it's not easy, no, I'm not stupid, no, you're not stupid at all, too bad. You better not laugh, though. <laughs> okay, how did it feel? Was it better when somebody acknowledged how hard you were trying? Yeah. 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 Let me tell you what you tend to say when this happens. Here's the words out of your mouth. It's okay. It's okay. Don't worry. I can't say something. I'm an intelligent, smart human being, and I'm not able to get the words out, and you're telling me it doesn't matter? <sighs> Are you an idiot? <laughs> now notice why I'm going to escalate. Why am I escalating? Because you're not getting it. When you tell me it's okay that I can't come up with what it is I want to tell you, and I teach, there's something really wrong here and it's not okay. And you saying it's okay is just sort of like discounting me. And I matter. It's much better to say you're trying so hard and, it's, and you're really smart and it's not coming out. This is really hard. Yeah, I hate this. I hate this. Because now you come and you're on my side. We're in this together rather than you're the smart one, you're the one that has all the skill and I'm the stupid one. I'm not liking this. I'm the one who's losing everything and you're the one who keeps everything. How is this fair? I'm not liking this at all. I don't think this is right at all. 
And here's another of my favorites. I'm sorry you're right. Go ahead, say it. <laughs> I'm sorry you're right. It is one of the hardest things to say with conviction when you know they're wrong. But you got to let it go. And you get, I'm sorry you're right. I'm sorry you're right. You've got to give up being right. It's so hard though. Okay, now, shake hands with your partner. Yeah, oh, now that was a real different way to offer help. When you do what actually comes automatically, which is connect in a friendly way, you eliminate a lot of problems. Our challenge is we see ourselves as caregivers, not care partners. We want to give care, but to give care, there has to be a receiver. And people with dementia frequently don't realize they need the care, and so it turns into a battle because you have something they don't want. They don't want your help. They don't, I know what I'm doing. Do you think I don't, I've, I've dressed myself for years. I know what I'm doing. And yet, I can't figure it out. And to have to admit that, it's really hard. I don't like this. There's a lot about this I don't like. So when you come in and you worry more about our relationship and getting connected to me before you try to offer me anything, and we learn to do it together, with your partner, shake hands. And I want you to get to your partner's side and see if that just feels different in general. Notice the hand now. Yeah. You're like this. So you're not pushing. Now try to push like that. It doesn't work the same at all. You're actually connected, aren't you? Yeah. It's a very different relationship. You're learning to dance with this partner. You're learning to go where they are first. Okay? Thanks. Yeah, not a problem. Let's go this way. I'm going to get you back, so don't go too far. All right, so have a seat. Yeah, you can take this one. That'll be good. Okay? So what we're going to be talking about for the rest of the session is how to take some of the principles we've just talked about and maintain this positive relationship with the person who has dementia. The first belief I have, and so you have to know what I believe, after 33 years of clinical practice, but before that, when I was a kid, my grandfather moved in. So I got to do this up close and personal with my grandfather. And I was actually much better with my grandfather than my mother was. My mother couldn't really quite grasp the idea that he couldn't remember, because he could remember all the old stuff. And so if he could remember that, then he could surely remember the things she just told him. But of course he couldn't. So almost to the day he died, she still would say, Dad, what did I tell you? <laughs> it's like, I don't think it matters, Mom. <laughs> but go ahead, feel free. The other thing I'll tell you is that I believe the best way to work with people with dementia is to learn how to do their dance. You start with them where they are. You go where they are first, and then you help them shift the rhythm. But you can only do that if you're willing to do their dance first. You let them start off in the lead. You figure out where they're at, what they're able to do, what they aren't able to do in that moment. And then you use that to guide and direct what you do. Because you're going to actually become a reflection of where they are. You can't make them come to you. You've got to go where they are. And so you've got to be comfortable with wherever they are in that moment. And that means if I'm upset, you have to be okay with me being upset. And so when I'm saying, I want to go home, I want to go home, why are you people keeping me here? You need to be able to say, you want to go home, you hate being here. The most frequent response, Tifa, this is a really nice place, why are you so upset? <laughs> Now, what did I just do? I was really mean because he spontaneously was trying to be helpful to me. And it's like, well, let's give her something to do. Let's distract her. Oh, I don't think I want to try to distract her right now. She's pretty much into a full rant. I need to be willing to go where she is before I can ask her to be distracted. I don't have a relationship with her. In this moment, she doesn't want a relationship with anybody. So I've got to get her to accept me in her world which is basically get mad at the place too. This place sucks, I'd want out of here too. 
Come on, let's get the hell out. <laughs> okay, well, come on then. And all of a sudden, what happened to my big anger balloon? It went away because you came on my side of the mirror and you saw me as okay and you saw the situation as I was describing it. And all of a sudden, I'm not alone. I didn't need to fight everybody because I've got somebody on my side. And as soon as I have somebody on my side, well, where are we going? <laughs> You're wanting to know where we're going. Well, let's just go out for a few minutes. Because all of a sudden, it was just I needed to not be in a place that didn't feel right. And I needed somebody to listen to me that I didn't want to be here. And the longer you let that escalate, the longer it's going to take for me to come down off that rage. Because if I've had to really cruise on up there, let me out! Let me out! Let me out! Let me out! Let me out of here! You let me open this damn door, I'll take your head off. Do you hear me? Yes, Chipa. You want out. Yes, I want out. Do you speak English? <laughs> what do you think I want out? Yes, I want out. Little shit. Now, why am I still, and I swear because if you haven't heard it, you haven't worked in the house very long. <laughs> and I'm going to tell about why that is, and it happens because that's a preserved brain function. I wish it weren't, it is. It's part of what remains. That part of the brain stays really active almost until the end of life. Okay, we'll talk more about it in a second. So we're going to come back to that scenario. So what I'm going to tell you here is the basics of success. We don't have much time and got a lot to go through. The basics of success, number one, learn how to be a detective, not a judge. We got too many judges in this world. We need more people to be curious, to be wanting to figure things out, to want to dive in and figure this out, to learn about people. And so what I have here is sort of a cheat sheet to become a better detective. Share those around. Great. And this is called a My Way sheet. And it's going to have some things on it that you're going to absolutely go, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I'm going to bet you there's also some things on it that you may go, ah, huh. Well, I bet that might be something to find out about. Okay, so we're going to pass that around and get you a chance to look at it. When you are a good detective, you learn to use your senses to figure things out. So take your hand out because this is what I really like about your hand. It's at the end of your arm. And you're not going to have to go look for it in a little bit. And it's going to become your cheat sheet. Human beings have five senses that help them understand the world out there. So take your hand and have it be the world out there. Okay? Five ways to take what's out there and get it in here. So take your hand and put it right up here. This is what your brain does. It takes what's out there and gets it in here so you can understand what's going on. So here it is. You ready? Five senses. Start with your thumb. Thumbs up. Visual information. What you see. Visual cues in the world around you. Stuff you see. Tells you about the world around you. So thumbs up. Visual information. This is the number one way that you get a lot of data into your brain through what you see. The second way that you get stuff in your brain, take your index finger, what you hear, auditory information. Coming in. <laughs> sit down, sit down, sit down. Uh uh, sit down, uh uh, sit down. Do you want to fall? Sit down. Where's your walker? Sit down. That's not your room. Uh uh, that's not your room. That's not your room. Take this index finger. This is you running your mouth. Shake it at people. Now, how many of you, when you see a finger being shaken at you, are thinking, oh, yes, let me cooperate? <laughs> are you thinking, let me take that and bake, break it or bite it? Whichever would you... Or how many of you think, I'm so sorry, I didn't mean to make you mad? The visual information that you share with your face when you're trying to say these things, the words, the tone of voice. Say sit down to your partner. Sit down. Sit down. Now say sit down. Sit down. <laughs> I need you to sit down. Sit down. Would you sit down? Uh-uh. 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 Uh -uh. Sit down. If you put a tape recorder in some of the common areas sometimes, guess what you would hear? Uh-uh. Sit down. Uh-uh. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Uh-uh. Whoa, whoa. What are you doing? Oh, no, 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 no. Hang on. Just a minute. Wait a minute. Wait. 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 What are you doing? Where's your walker? Where's your walker? 
Ah, uh-uh, that's not yours. Ah, uh-uh, that's not yours. Oh, leave her be, Mary. Leave her be. Leave her be, Mary. And I have not been in your buildings. I just know dementia. Third way we get information in, take that third middle finger, drop it down a little bit, and rub it on the back of your other hand. Now, this is a cool one. This is touch and movement. It's a twofer. There's the passive thing where it's coming through your skin. So you notice that when you touch something, you feel it. But I also want to point out movement gives you information. So you feel things and you do things. And when you do things, you feel things. And when you feel things, it causes you to move. So if you touch a really hot surface, what will happen? You pull back really quick if you're intact. What if you have something really cold in your hand and you don't like the feel of it? You'll let it go. Except you won't. You'll put it on a safe surface and let it go. <laughs> Not so much. Okay. Four sets. You ready for this one? Smell. Smell. Now, here's the interesting thing about smell. I put it on the ring finger because the ring finger is where you put your wedding ring, which is a tight, intense emotional connection to somebody. Of all the senses, your sense of smell is the most emotional sense there is. When you smell something, you will have an emotional reaction to it right away. Smell emotion. It's the most primitive part of the human brain. It is one of the real basic senses. So your sense of smell is really, really important. Okay, we're going to come back to this in just a few seconds. Okay. The last one, taste. sense of taste. Sense of taste. So what was the first one? What you see, visual. What you hear, auditory. What you feel, touch, move. All kinds of things through this one. This one's a real important one. And then there's what you smell and finally what you taste. Dementia changes all of these because dementia is not about memory problems. Dementia is about brain failure. Okay, now what I'm going to show you here, this is sort of the latest technology out here. This is called a PET scan. It actually lets you look at living human brains, and what you're looking at is the chemistry in the brain, not the structures, just the chemistry, because your brain burns fuel to work. Okay, and the fuel that it likes is glucose. It loves sugar. Oh, yeah. So when your brain is really active and it's really doing a whole lot, it'll burn red. It'll show up as red in a PET scan. Yellow, pretty active. The dark blue purple areas that you see in that first column, you see them there and elsewhere, those are called the ventricles. That's where you have fluid in your brain. No activity in that area. It's just fluid, cerebral spinal fluid. It cleans your brain. It has an important purpose, but there's no activity in there. Okay? So what you're looking at, that first column, there's two pictures of a human brain. One is like this, and the second one is more at an angle. And the person is lying in a machine, and we're taking pictures of their brain like this, slices. We're taking pictures of slices. And the top part up there is the front of your brain, and the bottom down there is the back of your brain. And then it's, as you look at the picture, it's left side, right side. So the person's lying like this. So this is the left side of the brain and the right side of the brain in the picture. Okay, you see it? Okay. Now, the first... First sets of pictures, those two pictures, that person has been asked to solve a very complicated problem while they lie in the machine. So what do you notice is going on? Lots of activity in the brain, huh? Second column, the person's been asked to do the same task. The problem is they're in early Alzheimer's. They are experiencing early Alzheimer's. Now, let me have you show you something. Out of 10 people, put up 10 fingers. Out of 10 people with early Alzheimer's, out of 10, only about two are going to carry a diagnosis. The rest are flying under the radar. It's not so bad all the time yet that they get caught at the doctor's office. Because when they go to the doctor's office, it's showtime. <laughs> and their brain goes, you better shape up or they'll put you someplace. And it's like, I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. And they will be able to do things in the doctor's office. They have not been able to do things in regular life for up to like a year. And all of a sudden, in the doctor's office, they can answer questions. They can give the, and it's like, now here's your mistake. You think, aha, they're doing this on purpose. No, they aren't. It was just chemistry. When I'm in the doctor's office, my brain goes, shape up. I know. 
It's my phone saying, you only have 15 minutes. Gosh, where did the time go? So what happens is it also happens at the driver's license renewal place. <laughs> and for you all, here's the other time it happens when family come in from out of town. And so they make you into liars because you're saying, I think your mom needs more help. I think we need to talk about, you know, whether or not she's it. And, and the family goes, I was here. She was fine. I mean, she just got dressed right in front of me. Da -da -da -da, and you're thinking, brain chemistry. And chemistry as well as structures impacted by this disease. Look at that second column. What do you notice? Not as much red. So they're still doing things, but not as well. They can't do the fine skill. They can't keep it up. They don't have the reserve. So they do great in the morning, but by afternoon, get out of here. Shut up. Who are you? It's like, whoa, what is going on? They go out with the family. When they come back, it's like crash and burn. They do great on the first shift, the second shift. By third shift, they're staying up. They can't settle down. They're, they're so, and everybody's going, go, oh, what is going on? It can simply be that their chemistry runs out. They can't recharge their batteries as well as you and I can recharge our batteries. They don't have that ability anymore. But I also want to point out there's some parts that are particularly not working as well. In order to do that, we need to do a quick brain tour. You ready? Hand to the front of your brain. I want you to say, whoa. Whoa. And aha. aha. The front of your brain is what part that allows you to behave yourself and have good ideas and make good choices and decisions. It is the last part of the human brain to develop. It's called the executive control center. Teenagers do not have a fully developed frontal lobe. <laughs> Males are slower to develop frontal lobes than females. <laughs> Males will not have a fully developed, mature frontal lobe, if ever, <laughs> until their late 20s or early 30s. Females, 25, no, that's early. You're wishful thinking, Jordan. I think you're pushing the envelope. Females, early to mid 20s. Now, what this means is, notice that they will charge more for young males to drive motor vehicles. Why? Because you put them behind the wheel of the car, they forget everything they know about the bigger picture. I mean, it's like, I bet I can get it to go 80. I bet I can get it to go 90. Hand me that beer. And it's like, what were you thinking? I don't know. Okay. Frontal lobe. Put your hand here. Now, pull it off because I want you to realize what's underneath that frontal lobe. Take your index finger and poke at it. Deep inside your brain is a part of the brain where all your impulses live. The impulse to have sex, say whatever you want, to do whatever you want, to grab five cookies off the table, even though there's 10 people in line behind you. <laughs> to eat them, even though you're diabetic. <laughs> to tell somebody, I'll give a shit, do whatever you want. You know, this is what's keeping you from doing is your frontal lobe. The frontal lobe keeps you from doing what you want to do. Spread your fingers apart. This disease causes your frontal lobe to not be solid anymore. So guess what happens? Impulses slip through. So I can know I'm not supposed to do something. I know it's mean. I know. I don't give a shit. What did I tell you? Are you a whore? <laughs> you are good looking enough to be a whore. And you've got red streaks in your hair. I hear whores do that to their hair to get customers. <laughs> Honey, don't cover your face, you're pretty. <laughs> now, this is the moment where you're thinking, tell me she did not say that. <laughs> well, I did, and unfortunately it's when you take me out to eat at, at a restaurant sometimes or when things happen. I'm not doing it on purpose. It's whatever comes into my mind, what normally would have happened. I might have had a thought, wow, nice boobs, but I would not have said it out loud. Now, anything I think comes right out of my mouth. And so any thought that I have, I, I say, you're born, aren't you? Why are you doing with that shit in your ear? <laughs> now, not only do I say whatever comes into my mind, I do whatever comes into my mind. So I approach people and put my hands on them. I will physically go up and touch people. I will, oh, nice apple. And it's like, Tipa, that's mine. Well, you shouldn't have laid it out. <laughs> now, a little earlier on, I might say, well, I'm sorry, but it was just sitting there. I know 
I, do you know how much I spend to stay here? If I want to have an apple, I'll have an apple. Yes, you I'm can. Sorry. I'm sorry. Yes, you can. I'm sorry I upset you. Good. Well, it's okay, but you don't have any call to be the boss of me. I pay your salary. You're absolutely right. I know that. <laughs> now, frontal lobe. Take a look at the frontal lobe up there. Is it failing? Yeah. Look at it by the late stage. You got it. You got it. Go, go, go. You put it better get it. Yeah. Oh, boy. Look at him. Let's get it here. No, I got it. Let's get this right here. Yeah. <laughs> let's talk first. Oh, let's talk let's first. Talk no, first. No, I'm not, I'm, 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 no, I'm not interested. Now, stand up. Just, now, here's the thing. What I want to point out is Jordan had choices long before he made the one he made. Jordan had a choice as soon as I turned toward him and looked at his crotch. <laughs> Jordan had choices as soon as I got a little closer. Jordan had, don't, don't, don't shoot it down. Now, this is where Jordan made a mistake because Jordan tried to grab my hand rather than simply going, Teep of snow. Hey! And get excited to see me, but give me a big visual that says, Showtime. Because if you do that, you can get right to the side and you can be the boss of me without feeling like you're the boss of me. <laughs> and this is going to be a lot more comfortable for Jordan than this, I think. Yeah. <laughs> hey, hey, hey! You're a sweet fella. Come on. Let's have sex. Come on. <laughs> Now, do I necessarily even want to have sex? No, it's just something that came out of my mouth. Because, yeah, you can sit down. <laughs> because, put your hands to your temples. This was what? Frontal lobe. And the impulses hiding underneath. They're still there, but I'm losing that control. Temporal lobe. Okay, you ready? Left, right. Left, right. Language on the left. Rhythm on the right. Language on the left. Rhythm on the right. You lose on the left, retain on the right. You lose language, but you keep rhythm. So in other words, I'm going to lose vocabulary, comprehension, and speech production. But I'm going to keep automatic social chit-chat, the rhythm of speech, music and prayer, and anything else with a rhythm, and expletives. Swear words, sex talk, racial slur, and ugly words. Preserved. <laughs> to the very end. Now, you learn your first word, your first swear word, usually between the ages of two and seven. You're, that's the age when you learn your first one. And you initially will put it over in the regular vocabulary section, not realizing that it's a special word. So you go home, though, because everybody was giggling about it. And you say, hey, mom, shit. And your mom goes, what? And you go, shit, where did you hear that? We don't use that word. Oh. <laughs> That's right, Daddy did. You and your father, I'm going to have a word with him. I never want to hear it. And so what you do is you pull the word out of regular vocabulary. You pull it out of your left temporal. And you look at it for a second. You go, well, I don't want to forget it because I don't want to go through that again. But I shouldn't say it in front of Mom. So, hmm. And your brain goes, I know, I know. Let's put it over here on this side. You won't use it in front of mom because it won't be in regular vocabulary, but you'll have it just in case. Now, you build that vocabulary. So here's where it comes in handy. And it actually has been demonstrated with research. This is research stuff. This is evidence-based stuff. If I'm in a parking lot all by myself and I accidentally slam my fingers in a car door, nine out of 10 of you in this room, nine out of every 10, what you will do is go, Shit. And you do the little shit dance that goes with it. There's a little dance that goes along with the word. Okay? When you finish the shit dance, what will have happened? Your brain will release endorphins. What are endorphins, nurses? Pain relievers. They're pain relievers, and it drops your cortisol level, stress reduction. That's where they come in handy. These words actually cause you to have stress reduction and less pain. But if there's a three-year-old standing next to your car in the parking lot, slam. Nine out of 10 of you will do this. Oh, shoot. 
son of a gun, gosh darn that hurts. Oh, man. Demonstrating an intact what? Frontal lobe. And the ability to go over here and get substitute words. <laughs> Let me show you another picture. This is your brain. Now, these are the real deals. These are actually autopsy brains. And what we have are two men. These men were the same age when they died, same physical size, and even had the same measurement around their skulls. The only difference is this gentleman died in an accident with an absolutely healthy brain, and this gentleman died at the end of living with Alzheimer's for 10 years. Now, get up three fingers, three fingers. Your brain will shrink down to one-third its original size. You're going to lose two-thirds of your brain tissue. This brain is shrinking from the outside. And this is the outside. You're looking at the surface, the cortex. The front of the brain is at the bottom, and the back is up top in this picture. But it's also shrinking from the inside. So it shrinks from the outside and the inside. Let me show you the middle of your brain. See those little holes there, those little dark spots right there and there? Those are those ventricles we were talking about. Those are those same ventricles at the end of the disease. That's how big they get. That's how much shrinkage of your tissue. You've got one third of your tissue left. So you've got some things left, but you've lost a lot. See the green circle? The green circle is your left temporal lobe. That's your language, vocabulary, comprehension, speech production. Look how little you have left. And the two kinds of tissue that you see there, the white colored stuff and the dark colored stuff, the light colored stuff is called white matter. It's the wiring that connects one section of your brain to the other. And the dark colored stuff is called gray matter. It's the storage cabinets in your brain. So you have to have storage cabinets, but then you've got to have wiring to get things in and out. This disease robs you of both. So what you'll see is, look at the blue circle. That's the left temporal lobe. That's the right temporal lobe, excuse me. That's the right, over here on the right. And it's better preserved. Automatic social chit-chat, well, I'm never in that something. Well, hi, sweetheart. <laughs> oh, yeah, well, that'll do it. The second thing, the rhythm of speech. Men here, and they're going down, and they're going down, and they're going down, and they're and they're going down, and you put it in a hand, and you get down, and you get in a hand, and you go down, 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 you put it in a hand. You gotta hit him, you gotta get a hand, you gotta get a hand, and then. I can also hear the rhythm of your speech, which gets us in trouble. Because you trick me with the rhythm of your speech. You think I get what you're saying, I don't. All I do is get your rhythm. Right. Right, hang on. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I have here. Let me have here. I have here. Okay. Yeah. I have here. Okay. You with that? All right. All right. Well, I have here. I have here. Right? Right? Yeah. I have here. Oh, yeah. You have here. Now, Greg should know better because he was in the class. But still, in this moment, when I start saying things like, hey, you ain't huh? The visual cue I'm giving is the answer is yes. Say yes, Greg. Say yes. And I trick him into saying yes. And he doesn't know what I'm saying to him, but he knows he should say yes because he knows it was a question. I'm like, hey, 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 okay? What I said is I'm going to start by taking off your pants, okay? <laughs> and then I give him a good visual cue like, ready? <laughs> and, and, and Greg goes, Sure. <laughs> and then out of nowhere, you ready? <laughs> what am I saying? Out of nowhere, what do I do? I touch him. Out of nowhere. Go ahead and do this. This is when you touch out of nowhere. Turn to the person next to you and shoot him the bird. How many of you are going, yes, come spend time with me? How many of you are going, don't do that to me. I don't like it. When you touch without awareness, when you touch without getting permission, when you touch without good visual cues that match the verbal and then add touch, you can add touch to what you're doing and get a just right response. The problem is when you touch out of nowhere. That's how it feels to the person with dementia. So they push back. They push back because they don't, whoa, whoa, where do you get off? Now, Greg, hey. Now, I've got to tell you, Greg has a memory of me. It's not a clear one, but it's real <laughs> emotional. <laughs> and he doesn't trust me anymore. And if we all wear the same color outfits, I can ruin this for everybody. Oops. 
Can we turn that off for a second? I know I've got to, I've got to wrap up, and I will. I will. Here we go. We're here, we're here. And I say, Greg, wash up. A little bit. Okay. <laughs> Do your shirt. Mm -hmm. No. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Good. Mm -hmm. That's it. Notice. <laughs> now, he's struggling. He can't quite get it. But he did get what I was saying, didn't he? How do you know? Because he started doing what I asked him to do. Notice how few words I used. Take your index finger. You need to quit this. You need to quit this. You need to quit this. This is talking too much. This is talking like you're the boss of them. And this is getting loud. You need to quit all that because it's not helpful. You need to make sure that your verbals match your visuals. Because when your visuals and your verbals don't match, take your visuals and your verbals, don't match them. Put the gun to your head and pull the trigger. Because you're not going to get where you want to go. You're going to get in trouble. Now, when I'm in this position, I say, Greg, let's do here. There you go. You got it. This is a lot less scary when I do with him than if I try to do to him. <laughs> yes, yes, it is. And the reason that is so, look at the red circle on top. You see the red circle? Put your hands on top of your head. Index finger up and down. You have a map of your entire body up on your brain called your sensory map. You know what's happening all over your body because the sensation comes in from all over your body and gets processed by your brain. You do not know what's happening until your brain tells you what's happening. And then take your little finger and run them up and down. That's movement. You control every muscle in your body from your brain. And these two talk to each other a whole lot. Look at that white matter, the wiring in that part. By late in the disease, look at that wiring. So although you all are sitting in these chairs, and every now and then, every 30 seconds, one cheek sends a message up to the brain that goes, hello, we need oxygen down here in the left body. <laughs> Your brain hears the message and goes, hang on just a second. Shift right. Shift right. You shift over the right. How's that, left body? That's good. I'm good for 30 seconds. Thank you. I'm refilling the capillaries. I'm getting oxygen to tissues, remaining, removing waste products. I'm good. 30 second slider. This is the right buttock. We need oxygen. Most of you don't know this is going on, this conversation between your butt and your brain. But I can tell you that it's happening because not anyone in this room, when you're sitting here, suddenly leaped up and went, ow, ow, something's sticking in my ass. Look and see, what is it? What is, no, look, I'm telling you, it's stuck. Get ready. With this disease, it can happen because suddenly a simple weight shift is beyond me and I don't realize what's going on. And I think it's this thing sticking in my butt when all it is is I needed to shift my weight. It also means I can fall out of a chair trying to shift my weight because I overshoot the mark or I could sit for six hours and develop a pressure sore because I don't know what to do. So our time is up. If we had more time, we could learn so much more because there's so much more to learn. There's a huge amount to learn about the back of your brain. Put your hand back here. Vision. It changes dramatically. Remember how I said smell and taste? Smell changes. They lose safety awareness. They don't notice things like smoke. They don't mind things like chemical smells. They can drink a glass of Clorox and not realize what they're doing. Spoiled food. They'll eat spoiled food not realizing it's spoiled food. They, they'll eat it. And they will not recognize body odor as a signal to take a bath. And finally, they will not know urine and feces as a yucky smell or a yucky thing. So I'll reach down in, thinking it's chocolate, chocolate but it doesn't taste very good. So now I've got to get rid of it. Hey, Tifa, you need help? With that? <laughs> <laughs> help you with that? No, I've got it. I can tell. <laughs> All right. Well, our time is up. I hope I made you think just a little bit about what happens and why it happens, because you're the piece of the puzzle that makes the difference. And if you're not a good detective, people with dementia suffer, because you're the one who needs to figure it out. Thank you all. Thank you.
Tifa Snow. You're good, Tifa Snow. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. One more time. And I want to say thanks so much to, for, to Tifa for going out of her way to make it here today despite big hurdles. Thank you. So, we are going to need about five come to the front. It's not an official break, and don't get in their way. So just sort of hang in there, and uh, we are going to be serenaded in just about five minutes. Thank you.